Welcome to Legends of Data and AI. Each episode includes inspiring and actionable data and artificial intelligence insights from global leaders across industries. Your host, Dr. Usama Fayyad, was the first chief data officer at Yahoo and is chairman of Open Insights and executive director of the Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University. Welcome everyone to another episode of Legends of Data and AI. Uh, my name is Osama Fayyad. I'm with Northeastern University and chairman at Open Insights. Uh, with me today, we have a very special guest, uh, Mike Colhain, uh, who did his uh, undergraduate uh, degree in uh, uh, London School of Economics, uh, worked for 10 years in uh, investment uh, banking, and then started a very interesting company uh, called uh, Pepper money, uh, which he actually ended up taking public uh, and then went uh, private through a major uh, private equity firm, KKR. And uh, now they, they actually just uh, relisted or went public with their Australian only business and have you know, other plans for, for the future. Um, welcome, Mike, and great to have you here. Thanks, Osama. It's a pleasure. So you had a, an interesting uh, journey with Pepper. Um, how has the need for, uh, well, first of all, maybe a few words about how you think about Pepper. You know, how should we think about the Pepper business? Yep. And into that, why, why would data and advanced analytics and AI become relevant in, in a company sure. like Pepper? Sure. So we, we are a financial services company doing two things, firstly, lending money to consumers, um, and then secondly, managing loan portfolios. Uh, and that's across 14 markets today. Started with one, uh, which was Australia, but we've expanded from there over the last sort of 10 years or so. Um, and so you can imagine, given those different operations around the world, given the different types of consumer behavior that we've seen over the years, uh, you know, the need for data and advanced analytics within our businesses become ever more important um, during that time frame, And I think, you know, on the one hand, we would obviously be using when we're making a lending decision um, data to make sure that we are making the right credit decision for that borrower at that moment in time. But what we've already seen, I think, is there's many more applications that we can use uh, data and AI for within our business. So it's not just only creating accurate credit scores, but it's how we can optimize operations, how we can manage our customers through their life cycle, how we can predict new customer needs, uh, when customers might be at risk so we can take appropriate action. Um, for example, during periods such as COVID, we were very involved in doing that. Um, also, how can we run our operations more effect effectively? How can we allocate the right human and capital resource to the right part of the business depending on ebbs and flows and cycles and so on and so forth. So all up, I think that comes together and helps us create sort of deeper and more valuable relationships, I would say, with our, with our partners. And our partners are obviously, first and foremost, our customers, but then secondarily, stakeholders in the business, which we banks, non-banks, fintechs, funds, finance partners, investors in securitizations, warehouse line providers, um, the whole gamut. So at a high level, that's what I would say AI has done for us too in terms of driving better performance, high performance. Uh, Pepper is in money lending, many lending businesses, you know, mortgages, personal loans, car loans, and even retail purchase lending, which is a very hot area these days. Um, yeah. And, and, and of course, you, you also kind of look at big loan portfolios and help uh, other institutions manage their portfolios. And yeah. often you wind up kind of making decisions uh, that many banks don't have enough courage or knowledge to kind of make uh, yeah. and, and, and doing so uh, uh, profitably. Um, from a data and AI perspective, are, are these businesses very different or similar? And, and what are the challenges in launching multiple offerings in the same market? Yeah, 
That's a good, that's a good question. Um, they are absolutely different at the local level. So I think one thing that we've learned over the last 21 years is that every market has its different nuance. And so you can't have sort of a one size fits all solution. Um, however, having said that, as I sort of mentioned a couple of minutes ago, there are some common traits that one needs to take account of, which do transcend markets. So for example, <clears throat> filling the, the prospect funnel with the right type of customers, including optimizing relationships with introducers, be they brokers or be they ecosystems, that's common. Um, obviously making that credit decision and pricing that person, that customer correctly, including understanding the risk of prepayment losses, that is common across all businesses uh, and all geographies. Um, In-life customer management, so trying to understand, again, where there's stresses and strains on the customer, how you manage that, that at a high level is common. When you cross-sell, to your point, you know, multiple products in the same market, an upsell, that, that's common. A product development, similarly common. And of course, operational um, optimization. But what you can't do, I think, is certainly in our world, I'm not saying for other worlds, I'm sure you can in other, other applications of AI, but what, what we've really found it difficult to do is take an algorithm from one market and plug it directly into another market. Because an Indian consumer will behave very differently from an Indonesian consumer, from a Spanish consumer, from an Australian consumer. And so that, that data set we have found needs to be specific to that marketplace to be of best use. But, you know, we, for example, trained uh, a model in Korea on prepayments. So predicting prepayments in, in Korea. Um, and that took us about six months to do. And then we were able to lift that and drop that uh, into our UK business. And instead of taking six months, it took four weeks because we had effectively the pieces which need to pull out the data and make sure we retrain the, retrain the algorithm on the underlying, underlying data set. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a nuanced answer to that question uh, in some respects. We're trying to build almost in a way, think about it as a, a library of applications that can be utilized across different product lines and different geographies with a suitable amount of localization that has to take place, put more simply. <laughs> no, and it's a, it's a fascinating business. I mean, uh, many people think about credit risk. Very few people actually think about the prepayment risk. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's, that's definitely a risk to the business where you invest in, in making that loan and then you, you, you get prepaid out of it, et cetera. So many, many, many dynamics there and, and many deeper yeah. modeling. If you had your, your, your uh, and, and by the way, it's, it's a pattern, the local, and in fact, now a lot of models are going hyper-local. Uh, yes. So it matters, you know, street to street sometimes. It matters, yes. you know, neighborhood to neighborhood in a city. Of course. Yeah. If you had your wishes from, from data and AI, what would be the impact on the business of Pepper if, assume magically, like you, you could get all you could get from data and AI? Um. I think that there's a number of different things that I would say to that. I, I think that the, the, the efficiency that it brings to the business and the clarity in terms of how you can um, interact with your customer, <clears throat> we've already seen, I think, where we can start to take that, Osama. I, mean, I think I would say baseball analogy was sort of maybe in the second or third innings on that. Um, I think that sort of, you know, if you're coming into the seventh or eighth, I think what you'd be actually hoping to be the case would be that you are, from the point of sourcing the customer all the way through to the point of um, managing the operations, all the way through to the point of funding your book, at every single micro segment along the way, uh, AI machine learning is optimizing those interactions and those processes and those transactions. That to me is what the sort of seventh and eighth innings looks like. 
because I think in that world, if you're doing that in such a way where you're using your team to their highest and best use, you're allowing them to focus on making that customer interaction ever more, I'm just going to use the word precise, but that sounds like a bit too mechanical, but, um, you know, helpful for the customer, then that's, that's what I'd like to see the ultimate manifestation of of AI machine learning being for us, which is our operations are efficient, our customers are getting a phenomenal service, our investors are like, wow, I'm getting all sorts of data, data and insights into the portfolio. I never thought I could dream of getting. And of course, yeah, hopefully, you know, we're building a moat around Pepper, which is such that it's hard for other people to replicate that. Eventually, of course, everybody will catch up, but it'd be nice if we could at least have a little bit of a, of a runway on that. So. I think it's all encompassing. I know that's a bit of a of a general answer, but I think what it also de facto allows us to do is is really free the team up to focus on those particular aspects rather than maybe some of the more mundane operational aspects that you know are, are happening now. So I would I would say it equally applies to our internal stakeholders as it applies to our external stakeholders if we can get it to work in the way that I think, you know, we should be able to over the next period of time. Hopefully that makes yeah. sense. And, and that no, makes a lot of sense. I mean, and, and, and having that technology allowing you to be agile and adaptive to market, market changes quickly is also, in my opinion, uh, a huge benefit to your customer because a faster response time, a more accurate response is, is, good, for, is good for everyone. Uh, so, I mean, what it tells me is, is that, you know, your business has a lot to get out of these technologies if they ever get to the point where we, we remove all the, you know, as you said, mundane and robotic tasks yep. and, and have people really focus, the employees really focus on, well, how do we lend better? What do we go yep. after? What are new strategic areas, et cetera? Um, right. You invested in data and AI at, at the group level and you're a group yep. of, you know, 14 markets. Yep. Um, are there good examples how the investments paid off across different across different BUs? I know you just mentioned Korea and, and the UK. You know, are there learnings about capabilities that do not transfer easily across markets or countries? And maybe the last one is if you have a story or two that kind of illustrate these. Yeah, I'll maybe blend the two together actually, because one one particular project we did which I found pretty interesting. So so a part of our business, as I mentioned, is to do with um, sourcing, buying, managing non-performing loans. Um, so we, we, we did a piece of work, um, our, our data team uh, at the global level did a piece of work in, in India with respect to the impact of weather patterns on the performance of non-performing loan portfolios. Why would that be a factor? Well, when you sort of think about it, uh, it's obvious why it might be a factor, but um, so monsoon, obviously is very important in India relative to agriculture and particularly important in certain aspects of the areas of the country. So we did a study and did some back testing on rainfall um, relative to loan performance. Um, and what came out of that study, uh, maybe not unsurprisingly, is if there's too much rainfall, there is underperformance. And if there's too little rainfall, there's underperformance. So, you know, the ability to try and uh, back test that, that's great. And then also try and get signals as to what you think the monsoon se season might be like, you know, the next one to three years. Obviously hard to predict the weather, you know, we will be retired if we could do that. But the point would be, I think, if you can get some directional signals around that, that's not something that I'm aware other people are using in terms of their overall pricing model. I'm saying that's one input, by the way, that's one signal, that's not, like yeah. the signal. But I think um, obviously how much it rains in Ireland doesn't really matter because it's always raining in Ireland. <laughs> so so on the on the MPL, the MPL read across from India to Ireland is not is not uh, you know complete. That's that's where that an example where that sort of you know transference of that algorithm wouldn't make any sense uh, in into into a multiple market. But I think that's one, you know, one example that would spring to mind. Another one that's actually 
has worked quite well for us is uh, using machine learning across uh, NLP applications. So in, in Spain, uh, we have a business that um, a lot of a lot of activity is conducted on the phone and a, a lot of that phone activity has to be compliant from a regulatory perspective. And so we had an army of people in Spain checking every phone call um, to make sure that the right things were said by our operators to the customers in the right sequence. It's very regimented. And so we basically uh, set up an NLP process where we're listening to the calls and the, and the machine learning will obviously score the call relative to particular attributes. Um, and that will generate effectively a quality assurance audit trail, which, you know, makes it much more efficient. But then as we were doing that, we learned a lot more from the phone calls in terms of talk over, tone of voice, uh, interaction of, um, of customers with, with operators. And we've now started using that capability in Australia. Um, so even though Spanish versus English, obviously different language, but a lot of the learnings that came out of Spain have been applied uh, in Australia. So I think that's, that's a good example where it has translated pretty neatly, notwithstanding the fact that there's a, there's a cultural and language difference on NLP, obviously. And I, I love that kind of the a scoring of the degree of compliance of a call or a process which you know uh, would also kind of be useful in, in real time ultimately. Um, I, I'm curious at a at a higher level, like if you look at lending businesses in general, uh, yes. I mean I would characterize them as having been relatively slow in leveraging data and, and AI as as they could have possibly. There are some strong examples of leveraging data, like you know in the credit card space, Capital One is, is an example that comes up a lot. Sure. Uh, sure. But the original. why has this not been replicated at scale? I mean, there's so much benefit and money at, at, at stake. You know, why is it that, you know, mortgages are still these very slow processes, the, the processing of them, the servicing of them is slow, the same for, for loans, like, you know, people have been doing, you know, car loans uh, forever and, and it, it doesn't look like, you know, the, the, the data that comes in you know, has improved. And of course, you know, uh, personal loans, which, which now I think we're seeing a lot of innovation on the retail side of it with kind of many new players in FinTech. But why has it been such a slow cycle for an industry that's been around for so long? Yes. I think, I think one area where the, where the focus has been intense and has improved is around that sort of credit worthiness of customers point. I think, I think that has been banks, non-banks, fintechs, they, they have been using the availability of data to a higher and better degree um, over the last decade or two, but particularly over the last decade. But I think what that has also meant is that the data analytics team is often housed within the credit risk function, um, and therefore has a sort of credit risk mindset embedded into it, which means that you don't necessarily have people who understand the broader business who are thinking about the applicability of data analytics solutions. So I think that you sort of have this um, understandable, but very, very, um, you know, tightly focused view on, okay, let's make, you know, the credit worthiness of customers, the central, the central crown of our data analytics capability, which leaves a huge amount on the table, in my opinion, because there's so many other ways that you can, you can use the capabilities. I also think there's a there's a big factor, um, which is you know you've just got a lot of legacy platforms, legacy systems within banks and other financial institutions, and to try and necessarily easily integrate machine learning and AI into those is can be somewhat difficult. Um, so I think that's probably a slight you know a, a problem that has to be overcome. And, and we read about the your billions and billions of dollars that get spent on maintaining old systems at banks it's it's mind-blowing and it gives you just a little taste of you know how difficult it is, it is to, to deal with these things yeah. um i think also you know a number of organizations have tried to sort of create momentum around data analytics but maybe have failed and, and why they failed i think you know there's they probably failed because traditionally people have tried to do sort of you know big tech projects. So they spend millions of dollars trying to create huge data platforms and they, 
they change, try and change the whole shape of their business. And that, you know, almost needs inevitably leads to massive overruns and they're, you know, therefore as a result, I wouldn't say definitely failure, but, you know, a higher chance of failure. It's just really hard to get that to work properly. And then I think with a focus on trying to create perfect data solutions, I think, you know, some organizations might lose focus on the application of the data itself and where the most value is and can be created. So what I mean by that is, you know, perfect data can be the enemy of getting things done. So, you know, I think, I think you need to think more about MVPs and fast time to value rather than trying to get the absolutely sort of perfect solution. Um, and then I think it's also a little bit back to my first point, important to have data analytics teams attached, attached to each department. So you've got like an agile team stapled to each department. So you don't get this sort of like, well, they're all over there. I don't want to deal with that data analytics team. They're, they're a bit odd. I'm just going to carry on my own business. You've got to have, I think, you know, support right next to you. And I think that that it's happening a bit more. You know, we actively try to do that, but I think that's probably uh, a challenge for some big organizations as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, as, as a business leader uh, and a businessman, uh, you know, looking at AI, what, what are, in your opinion, I mean, and this one is a quick question. What, what are the biggest issues standing in the way of making AI work? Is it, is it data dependency issues and you don't have the right data? Is it questions of business education to the opportunities? What, what's the biggest factor in your opinion? Yeah, you just, you just put your finger on the two. <laughs> I think I was thinking about some, which is, yeah, definitely education. Like, you know, what I think people need to understand what machine learning, statistics, data can do for you as an individual in the in the business and then how that can be delivered at scale so i think that that's a really really important point um you need to work teams teams to work together with each other uh, and you need to really understand the roi of what you're creating so i think that's 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 critical and then i think there's sort of you know a lot of a lot of organizations don't realize the power of the data they're actually set on um and you know, one of our businesses, for example, tracks every interaction with every customer through an application process, but then they overwrite it um, because they're like, well, I won't need that again. You know, th that type of data needs to be kept. That's gold. Yes. And so I think it's just really understanding um, how you make sure you create sort of, you know, data repositories that really capture the information that's helpful for you and your team. Um, to, get, to get AI to work right, you know, there's a, there's a big dependence on machine learning and data science and data in general. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you get that right data? How do you avoid from kind of letting the example you just said, very valuable data escape through the exhaust basically, instead of being utilized and, and kept and, and leveraged later um, at the right quality, at the right granularity. And, and perhaps related to that, you know, we, we live in a world where most databases really deal with structured data only, yet the majority of data in any organization, according to Gartner, 90% of the data in any organization is unstructured. Uh, yep. You know, yep. thinking about this, this whole topic of, of, of the dependence on data, what, what, what can we do? How, how do we fix this in, in terms of making sure that data is managed as an asset? I think you flip it on its head a little bit. And I think you, what you have to say is, what is, what is the low, almost separate apart from the data you have, what are the obvious solutions where machine learning and AI can benefit me as an organization? What, what's the highest, I use this a lot internally, so it drives people crazy, but what's the highest ROI that I can get um, when I look across the, the various different opportunities to deploy this type of technology? And then back solve for the data. So almost like take it from the application backwards rather than data forwards. And, and I think that will, what that will do is focus people's minds much more intently on the, on the business problem that can be solved rather than getting into a deep discussion on, you know, what type of granularity of data do I have or do I not? And then I think the second thing it will do is enable people to sort of coalesce around a, a solution and almost say, well, actually, if I'm going to make this application work better, 
right now it's okay. Maybe it's to 50% of its capacity, which is better than zero. But if I was actually to collect this data from the customer and retain it, then 50% could become 80%. So you're sort of almost, you're almost encouraging the, the user of the system to naturally come to the conclusion that they should be going out and capturing more data to make their applications more efficient. You have to be in a sort of MVP mindset, I think, to do that. Otherwise, you know, you, otherwise, if you're if you're a person that's solving for perfection and perfect data, well, that will probably never come. But that's that's unrealistic, I think, in today's world because it's moving so quickly. What a what a great answer, Mike. You actually uh, anticipated the next question I had, which is the, the advice you might have for companies, large and and perhaps small, of of how to think about AI and data. But I think that advice of you know start with the maximum value i love that uh, yeah. and kind of work backwards and see how much of that you can capture and what are the implications for data that's a beautiful piece of advice anything else you want to add to that or should i move to my last question <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think i think it's back to the point we mentioned earlier which is the education piece and make sure that your teams really understand what this technology can do for you that's that's where it begins and ends i think so I'll end with a question that is on all our minds and one of the big issues we face, you know, finding the right talent in AI and data science, the technicians who actually are, are willing to kind of do the right work and plug in with the business, understand it, and then do the technical contribution has always been a big challenge. There's too much demand, uh, too little supply and retaining that talent when they are in such high demand is even more challenging. What, what advice do you have regarding talent, how, how do you get it? How do you retain it? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, I think we were probably all sat here sort of five years ago thinking that um, everybody would be able to become a data scientist because the tools would be there and, you know, you know it doesn't, doesn't matter, you don't need specialists. Completely wrong, in my opinion. I think you need specialists more than ever. Um, and so there's certainly some aspects of, of the work that can be done by you know, non-trained data scientists, but there's the demand is so so high so i think it's it's you know as with anybody in an organization i think particularly you know the generation you know call it sort of you know 20 to 35 40 or that's not even true anybody anybody needs to have a very clear career path and understand what value they are adding to the enterprise and how that can change and expand over time and so i think you have to paint that picture when you're hiring data scientist is this is how important you are to me at Pepper. And this is where I can see you go based on your skill set and your desires and what have you. I, I, I'd love to sit down with people who are joining us in their say 20s and say, okay, what do you want to be when you're 35, 40? What do you want to be? What, what's your dream role? Accepting the fact that you can change your mind from time to time, that's perfectly acceptable. But let's try and set you on a trajectory for that dream role now. You, and you tell me the attributes you need to gather along the way to get there. I think if you have somebody really get into that, then then you there's two way loyalty there, which is which is extreme. So that that's probably more to the retention point. But I think in terms of the acquisition point, what we're doing is we we're lucky enough that we're in 14 countries. We're actually not in the United States, but we're in lots of countries outside of the United States, and we are finding some incredible talent in places like Indonesia. So we're hiring data scientists right now in Indonesia. We're hiring lots of data scientists in, in India. So we have the ability to country shop a little bit, which is probably a little bit of a, an advantage. And we're seeing some, some great talent in those markets. So I may be at a slight advantage because when I look back at you know, the UK and Australia where we've got big operations, that's not easy. Uh, the competition for talent is, is so, so high. But I think you know it's obviously a combination of paying people market rates, otherwise you're never going to get them. But but more importantly than that, I think it's actually giving them a true purpose in the organization which they can really latch on to. Thank you, Mike. I mean, to me, it, it blows my mind that you know, and this you know, looking at an area like data and AI, which is you know highly technical and specialized, you know, we're here able to sit down. And, and have you as a business leader uh, of, of, a, of a successful business that spans all the way from dealing with non-performing loans to dealing with where do I extend new credit to dealing with novel ways to do to it. 
and I, you know, I've been privileged and, and honored, frankly, to have had uh, taken part of that journey, having you know, Open Insights yeah. work with uh, yes. with Pepper Money. Uh, yes. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. And no uh, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions uh, following the the publications of the po of the podcast. Uh, nice. So thanks, thanks for being here, Mike. That's a pleasure. Thanks, Osama. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Once again, I uh, th this is Legends of Data and AI podcast. Uh, I'm Usama Fayyad, and I thank you for uh, listening in. Uh, and stay tuned for other exciting uh, episodes of, of our continuing podcast series. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks for listening to Legends of Data and AI. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the world of data and AI. If you're keen to learn more about making data and AI work in the real world and in any organization, join us next episode and subscribe to the podcast. As always, you can head over to open-insights.com to sign up for our email list, learn more about the work we do, and have access to data resources. See you on the next podcast.